Um, so I wanted to start asking you what what have you been up to since you since you resigned, apart from informing the world about Israel's wrongdoing. Um, what what have you been up to? Well, you know, I left the United Nations precisely because of the atrocities systematically being perpetrated in Palestine, on the West Bank, and in Gaza. And what I saw as a failure of of international institutions uh, and obviously of governments around the world to address it with the seriousness that this kind of historic horror requires. And that horror uh, about which I warned in my letter to the UN all the way back in October uh, has continued apace since then. I think we have seen uh, a complete failure on the part of the post-World War II institutions to address genocide, to address a massive assault on civilians like this. Uh, and we have seen that there are no limits, that this can continue to its logical end, which is the destruction of Palestinian society, the purging of Palestinian uh, civilians, the murder of tens of thousands, torture, summary executions, uh, maiming, um, breaking all world records with regard to the killing of children, the killing of journalists, the killing of aid workers and UN staff, the killing of medical personnel. I mean, we've had to um, change the balance sheet that's been used to address uh, crises and conflicts and so on around the world because Israel has no limits in its capacity for atrocity. And the international community and states of the West frankly, states all around the world, even in the Arab region, seem to also have no limits for what they will tolerate. So that is my, my first impression. And because of that, I have been compelled by history to continue working on this and only on this for almost a year now since I left the United Nations. I have um, worked only on what has been happening in uh, in Palestine for the past year. Yeah, because when you, I remember you wrote in your letter that it was a textbook genocide. Do you think if you had to write the same letter today, you would describe it as such? Or do you think maybe it would have been a way longer letter? Um, I mean, I can imagine to an extent. But how how do you feel the difference from when you wrote that letter to now? I think the difference is that now much of the world has come along and has affirmed what it was that we were saying almost a year ago, that this is genocide. Uh, we have since that time seen some meaningful action on the part of the General Assembly, no meaningful action on the part of the UN Security Council, which is blocked in its action principally by the United States and its, video, its veto, but we have seen some important resolutions coming out of the uh, UN General Assembly, in other words, the majority of UN states, including just yesterday, another resolution that um, affirms the findings of the World Court uh, and uh, mandates action to deal with the fact that the occupation of the Palestinian territories is entirely unlawful, that Israel is practicing apartheid and racial segregation, that it has a duty to completely and quickly evacuate all of its military and settlers and others from the occupied territories of the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, that it has to compensate and allow the return uh, of the Palestinians who have suffered arms. And more importantly, that all states around the world have obligations to make this happen, including uh, through cutting off economic and trade and financial relations, diplomatic relations, military support for what Israel is doing in the occupied territories. You also have uh, the fact historic in its own right, that Israel is on trial for genocide in the world court. And that that court has issued several provisional measures uh, demanding particular action from Israel, that Israel has ignored those mandates and has been supported in its impunity by Western states. But the fact that it is on trial for genocide, I think is historic. We also have the fact, uh, unexpected by many, who observe international legal mechanisms, that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has since then requested arrest warrants for the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense of Israel for crimes against humanity. So on the one side, you have, and all of that affirms what it was that I was saying in my, in my uh, letter, 
and and much of it changes 30 years really uh of movement in the opposite direction where international law when it came to the palestinians was put completely on hold as i pointed out also in in my letter uh where notions of uh, addressing root causes to solve conflicts like self-determination of the palestinian people uh, an end to apartheid, an end to foreign occupation, um, uh, an abandonment of the what I called the Oslo ruse that expected that Palestinians would have to negotiate for their fundamental human rights with the entity that is oppressing them and denying them those rights. That's over with, thanks to uh, the World Court and thanks to action in the in the UN General Assembly. Um, but. What I fear is that some of the other points of my letter that had to do with addressing root causes and getting back to our principles like human rights and equality have been missed because I hear again, some in the UN and many Western states repeating the mantra of the two-state solution and a process of negotiation. We've been talking about a two-state solution and a process of negotiation for decades. It has functioned entirely as a smokescreen behind which we have seen continued dispossession, persecution, uh, occupation, settlement expansion, gross violations of human rights, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and now genocide, uh, because they find it very convenient to talk about some long negotiating process that might somewhere down the road lead to a two-state solution, even though, as I said in my letter a year ago, that is now impossible. There's nothing left for a viable Palestinian state. There is no Israeli government, the current one or any others, that is going to give up the territory that it has stolen from the uh, Palestinian people. And in any event, that solution never addressed the fundamental rights of the Palestinian people that were stripped from them in 1948. It never addressed uh, the equality of Palestinians living inside the Green Line, inside what is now Israel. It never addressed the right to return, which is guaranteed under international human rights law. Uh, but it's very easy. If you just repeat that mantra, you don't have to deal with the real root causes in the way that the UN, the international community, many states insist uh, on addressing in other situations of conflict all around the world. So we haven't gone far enough in that direction yet, but there is this steady drumbeat of accountability that is unprecedented in the history of Israel and Palestine. With all of the legal developments I mentioned, with a massive and growing movement in civil society and countries across the world, with the mobilization of progressive Jewish organizations standing in solidarity with the Palestinians to end the occupation and to end Israel's um, uh, racist regime uh, in the end, uh, with uh, the growth of the boycott, divestment and sanction movement by leaps and bounds, the growth of the anti-apartheid movement, all of this is hope that there will be in the future uh, accountability for perpetrators, redress for victims, uh, protection for the vulnerable, which has not yet been uh, afforded. Um, but we know that we're dealing with a state that does not have limits when it comes to humanity, uh, and that there's a lot of pain and suffering and death to come before we reach that point of accountability and uh, and of liberation. So if I had to rewrite that letter, that October letter again today, I don't think I would change a particular word. I didn't, that was not a drafting exercise. I sat down and just let it pour onto a piece of paper without edit and sent it off um, because it's what was in my heart and what was in my head for a long, long time. And what is on the minds of many, many other people in international institutions who have been frustrated during these years uh, of inaction relative inaction by international institutions over a period of years. So I think I have been vindicated in what I said, uh, but horribly so. And, um, and the changes are encouraging that have been taking place with regard to the international community and civil society especially, but otherwise many more states have recognized the state of Palestine. You know, many important changes have, uh, have taken place but there are still no meaningful constraints on Israel's brutal actions in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in the Gaza Strip, against Palestinian citizens inside uh, Israel, in Lebanon, and, in, and across uh, the region. 
So uh, we are not yet we're at a point where we feel that we can see the light uh, just yet, but we know what direction to move in and we're moving in that direction. Yeah, because I think as well with, with the court decision and, and um, ICJ as well, um, it it seems that since they ruled out um, the the, uh, the the plausible genocide and and uh, um, what did you call it arrest warrants, it's almost like Israel is showing, you know, sorry, but fuck you, you know, it it's almost provoking that. You know, we were sitting having hope, we saw the court ruling, and then they're doing like they're, they're be, being even worse. You know, the what's been happening in the in the occupied territories escalated completely since that ruling. Um well that's that I think is the phenomenon of Israeli impunity. I mean, if you look at what the West has done uh since the founding of the state of Israel, first with the UK and then later handing the baton off to the United States, is they have worked very meticulously and continuously over a period of 76 years to build a wall of impunity around Israel so that Israel will not be held to the same standard uh, as other states, will not be accountable for international law or um, uh, humanitarian standards of, of any kind. And if you function in uh, behind a brick wall of impunity for 76 years, it creates a kind of arrogance. It creates a kind of... Uh, attitude that we cannot be touched because the U.S. will not allow us to be touched. Others in the West, the U.K., Germany, uh, uh, for example, uh, and therefore we'll do whatever we want to do. So you pass your court decisions all you want. We will slander everybody as anti-Semites and supporters of terrorism and so on, and we will continue to live above the law. But the idea of the rule of law, which is that no one is above the law, and accountability to it, and no one is below the protection of the law, including the Palestinian people, uh, is suffering a real strain as a result of that. You have Western countries that have centered their foreign policy, at least rhetorically, on ideas of the rule of law, human rights, international legal order, all of those sort of things, who are now openly and publicly tossing all of that out the window in defense of a single oppressive foreign regime that practices apartheid and genocide against the indigenous people of, of the country. And that's not only damaging the human rights of the Palestinian people, it's damaging the entire framework of international law and international institutions built up since the Second World War, beginning with the UN Charter uh, on the use of force, the human rights instruments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Genocide Convention, uh, international legal mechanisms, the UN itself, because people lose hope in in the international institutions. Is that what you what do you mean? Pe people are losing hope, and therefore those institutions are losing legitimacy, and mm -hmm. you will not survive without public legitimacy for uh, for very long. And the fact that so many Western countries have taken the side of a violating country instead of the side of international law threatens the sustainability of those institutions. And the fact that you know, I understand. You know, if you speak out against Israel, you are going to be persecuted. That's a reality if you are at the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the United Nations, any of these institutions, you are going to be slandered and smeared and threatened and harassed by trolls. I've been through all of it. Um, uh, and we know uh, from a number of revelations that the judges of the International Criminal Court, the judges of the International Court of Justice, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court are also being threatened uh, and, and harassed behind the scenes in order to silence them on, on Israel. So that's a very real fear. But and, and so it is at the United Nations, as I saw and as I've seen other colleagues subjected to, uh, it creates a climate of fear amongst those working within the international system as it's designed to do. But if you don't have the courage to be true to the norms and standards and mandates of your organization, because some powerful actor is going to smear you or, or threaten you, step down, move to another job and let someone do the job who's willing to stand up for principle because the cost to the Palestinian people in this case, but also to those institutions and the laws on which they're based is much too high. 
to make that compromise out of out of fear. And if I have to say anything over the course of the last year, the most powerful force in determining what has been happening has been the force of fear, designed as such and having that, that impact. The amazing, the remarkable thing is all of the courageous people, especially in civil society, standing up on college campuses or in the capitals of countries across the world to demonstrate in spite of the repression, in spite of the smears, in spite of police violence, in spite of being arrested, in spite of being beaten up uh, by thugs from, uh, from the other side, that they still in their thousands, their hundreds of thousands, ultimately their millions are standing up against not just what's happening in Palestine, but what the West is doing to underwrite what is happening in Palestine, that's very encouraging. And the fact that the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, in spite of the harassment and the threats and the smears, have been doing their job too slowly, but they have been progressively moving on their mandated responsibilities. That's, I think, where the hope comes from. Do you think the same thing is happening in the media and, you know, a climate of fear? Do you, do you think that's the reason it's been so pro-Israel biased? Well, you know, in the West, we have a lot of major media corporations, which I'm in the United States right now. Here, all of the major television networks, the three major television networks, all of the cable news stations from left to right, uh, and all of the major newspapers from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal um, are owned by corporations that um, uh, support Israel, both ideologically uh, and in terms of their editorial policy. And that is reflected in the reporting that they do. These companies also are large corporations that have interests in promoting Israeli technology, weapons, uh, uh, frankly, that, that profit from war and oppression. Uh, and so it's not surprising that on the one hand, because they share the ideology of Israel and support Israel. And on the other hand, that they have economic interests that are aligned with the continuation of these kinds of horrors, that these papers and uh, broadcast companies uh, would be so directly aligned. What is remarkable is, is that you would think they would try to dress it up a little bit, do a little both sidesing and so forth. But what we've seen is just propaganda in a very coarse sense, right? Nothing sophisticated. It's just blocking out facts about the genocide taking place in Gaza, the rote recitation non-critically of Israeli propaganda, including fabricating stories, um, dehumanizing language about Palestinians, reports designed to justify war crimes like attacks on hospitals, reporting false atrocities like the 40 beheaded babies, but re refusing to report the actual beheaded Palestinian uh, um, babies. So, so the fact that they so dutifully have lined up with the Israeli propaganda machine without even trying to hide what it is they're doing in, in any compelling way, I think that's remarkable. I think it's scary. And I think, as I've written, it's a moment when we have to be looking at media accountability. We need to protect free speech because we will be the first victims of any restrictions on free speech. It's not going to be powerful networks and newspapers and supporters of Israel who will be attacked uh, on free speech grounds. It will be us. So we don't want to in any way erode free speech protections. But there are precedents in international law for holding media actors accountable for incitement to genocide, for complicity in genocide, including going back to the Nuremberg tribunals with Julius Stryker of Der Sturmer or the Rwanda tribunal with uh, um, with uh, Rwanda media uh, actors being held accountable by the International Criminal Tribunal on Rwanda for incitement to genocide. And these companies in many of the same ways have crossed those lines. So in some cases, we have to look at the possibility of criminal accountability. In some cases, very narrow and, and specific cases. In other cases, there should be legal accountability uh, in civil courts where they've been involved in slander, where they their reporting has led directly to harms um, uh, to people, including uh, incitement. But in other ways, I think they can be held accountable even before we get into a court of law by uh, holding their bottom line accountable, by encouraging people to turn them off, to unsubscribe, to support independent media, 
um, uh, and to encourage others to 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 do the same. I think that's uh, that's the course that has to happen. I mean, most of these companies have suffered from declining subscription rates and economic challenges already. I think we have the power collectively in civil society to push them over the edge because they do more harm than good if they become a part of the mechanism of genocide, of war crimes, of crimes against humanity. That's a danger for all of us, ultimately. Mm. Very interesting. Just you mentioned Rwanda. Um, you, you worked at the UN since 1992. And I remember because I'm born in that year. <laughs> um, so you worked there for 30 years. Yeah, 32 years, yeah. 32 years. Mm. Uh, with everything you've seen during your time at the UN and now witnessing the Israel's war on, on like since October, what is the most shocking thing you see now? Like what what's because you resigned over over this. So so why is this war different? Or it could also be you just had enough. Uh, of the injustice? Well, this is different. I mean, we've never seen a case like this where there's been so much Western government complicity, so much Western media duplicity. Um, this, this genocide in Palestine could not be sustained without the support of Western governments like the United States. And it could not be sustained without the duplicity of Western media corporations uh, as Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman say, manufacturing consent for for genocide. And yet they have continued to play that role in ways that we have never seen uh, uh, since the Second World War. Uh, and that's that's very different because, you know, powerful Western countries have disproportionate influence in the world, including in international institutions. And all too often you see parts of the United Nations bowing to the power of the United States, the United Kingdom. Uh, and others at the cost both of the principles of those organizations and the victims who are left without without meaningful protection. You know, in Rwanda, during the genocide, the, the West, countries like the U.S. also committed grave sins in that they failed to prevent it or to stop it when they could have. So theirs was a sin of abstention. You know, they are they are obliged under international law, including international humanitarian law, not just to respect, but to ensure respect under the Genocide Convention to act, to stop and to prevent genocide. And they chose not to do so, going so far in diplomatic cables as to instruct all of their diplomatic outposts not to use the word genocide because they didn't want to be legally compelled to intervene in the Rwandan genocide. That's one level of sin. But what they're doing now is a whole different, higher level of sin because they're actively complicit in the genocide. They are complicit by arming and financing and providing intelligence support and um, uh, diplomatic cover, using their podiums to disseminate, Isra to disseminate Israeli uh, propaganda, using the veto to prevent a ceasefire or any Israeli accountability, threatening international judicial institutions. They are directly complicit in, genoc in genocide in Palestine. In Rwanda, their sin was they didn't stop it. But in Palestine, their sin is they're participating directly in it, and it could not be sustained if they did not do so. That's something I haven't seen. Uh, we've seen you know, great powers commit horrendous atrocities. The US in Iraq, for example, you know, an act of aggression uh, almost unparalleled in uh, in recent history and, uh, and, and you know, so many war crimes committed in the, uh, after that act of and during that act of, uh, of aggression. But this is on another level altogether. This is straining the post-war legal system, the post-war international system in ways that it's never been uh, strained before. And I don't know what comes after the collapse, uh, but it's not going to be something pretty. You know, we've seen what impunity does uh, and uh, and it's a threat. It's a threat to all of us. So, no, I haven't seen anything quite like this in uh, all of my time, in my 40 plus years in the international human rights movement or my 32 years uh, at, at the United Nations. But again, I am encouraged by how ordinary people have broken free from the matrix of corporate media and of their government's horrendous anti-human rights positions and are standing up to oppose this. And I'm hoping that the power from below 
will be what will begin to push things in a in a better direction. And as I say, that drumbeat is steady and it's growing. Uh, and I don't think people are going to be deterred by the kind of intimidation that has been wielded against them by their governments uh, and, and other supporters of Israel. No, I, I agree. It doesn't look like it because then people would not be on the streets anymore. They they would have given up already, but they are still there. Right, right. right. Um, you know, this is the, the difference, uh, one, one significant difference is <clears throat> if you talk to somebody who relies on corporate media for their understanding of what's happening in the Middle East, you won't recognize the story that they're telling. They'll have no idea about the genocidal statements of Israel's leaders. They'll have no idea about Israel's atrocities in the occupied territories. And they will still believe um, the fabricated propaganda that has been presented by Western media on behalf of Israel in order to justify the slaughter that's happening in, uh, in Gaza. But there are so many people millions who have turned away from that propaganda and who are firsthand seeing what's happening on their phones every day, the atrocities that are being committed. And no one in the editorial boardrooms of the New York Times is going to be able to tell them a story that doesn't align with their own eyes. As the old saying goes, what are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Uh, well, people have learned to believe their own eyes and not to accept the propaganda that's churned out by by these companies and by these governments and the tricks that they use, for example, you know, claiming, well, after every major atrocity, the response of a Western government official will be, we believe Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, first of all, it does not. Uh, it does not have an Article 51 right under the charter to defend itself in territory that it occupies and thereby to make war on that territory. It does not as a matter of law. Um, uh, and secondly, the crimes that it's committing are not justified by claims of self-defense in international law. But the journalists don't question this. They just, they just repeat it. Or the claim of human shields, which is almost always a lie uh, fabricated by Israel uh, just by virtue of the fact that you have a densely populated area in the Gaza Strip where you know, fighters and civilians happen to live in the same area, they try to make that a claim of human shields. That's not human shields under international law. Well, at the same time, we know, and we have documented over and over again by international investigations and international organizations, human rights groups, and so on, that Israel systematically does use human shields uh, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, and, uh, and so on. But that's not something that is not a narrative that's challenged mm -hmm. by Western politicians and, and Western corporations. Uh, so, and, you know, and the rest of the world tolerates it. They're horrified by it, but uh, other governments tolerate it. And it's much too, uh, it's a threat to their own legitimacy, vis-a-vis -vis their own people who are seeing what's happening and who are disappointed, you know, with the exception of, you know, South Africa, uh, arguably, you know, Yemen under the Houthis, uh, a few other countries that have signed on to these uh, cases in the international uh, courts, Um in the Arab region and across the world, countries have done very little beyond rhetoric to stop what is happening to the, the Palestinian people. Uh, and that's, that's hugely disappointing, but I think it's they do so at their own risk because the people of the world know what's happening and they're horrified. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I actually recently had a, a discussion with uh, a friend, but she's also a journalist and uh, I think it was in relation to your self-defense article. Um, you know, I sent it to her, we talked about it, but then, you know, it went into the media bias. And I told her that one thing that really has stood out for me is that Reuters, um, they might not give you false information, but one thing that then becomes false is the lack of information they give. So if they write, you know, so-and-so have been killed, uh, including one journalist and Israel has launched an investigation into the to the case. There's a dot there and they failed to to say just one sentence, you know, what what happens when Israel launched an investigation? Because then you 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 know you as a reader, if you if you don't know this, you're gonna think, oh okay, it's been taken care of, but it's not. Right, right. Propaganda by omission is one of the techniques that they use most most frequently. And that, that includes almost a complete blackout or a brownout uh, of information on the actual genocide, on the mass atrocities and uh, and so on. 
And then, yeah, these these little distracting things like uh, which you know, governments do it as well. They say, well, Israel must investigate this. Well, you're asking the perpetrator to investigate itself. And besides the fact that there is a long documented history of Israel either not investigating or fabricating in its investigations or investigating and not holding people accountable, or when they hold them accountable, they'll take someone who's committed mass murder and suspend them for three months or knock them down by uh, by a rank. That's what it means when it says Israel is investigating, but you won't see that in those articles. You will see it in reams of documentation over many decades produced by international organizations, human rights groups, and others. But there's no due diligence in Western reporting on Israel. It's simply parroting approved set of talking points over and over and over again. And that's why I've said, you know, some of them are complicit in what's happening. Mm. Do you think this is going to end with the prosecution of, you know, war crimes and <laughs> everything on Israel? Do you think they will be held accountable for, for what's been happening? Not for the last seventy-six years, but at least for the last year. Yeah, I think I think uh, the brick wall of Israeli impunity is over. It's done. I think you know uh, people have been chipping away at it in recent years, and in the last year during this genocide, huge holes have been blown into that wall of impunity. In spite, you know, despite the best efforts of the U.S. and the U.K. and Germany and other other Western countries. And I don't think those are going to be repaired. I think we will see some accountability. In the first case, you know, they have managed to uh, preserve themselves behind a shroud of legitimacy um, because that has been supported by power by Western governments and, uh, and and others. It doesn't work that way anymore. Information in real time is available to everybody. So that legitimacy is gone forever. Israel in 2024 is on trial for genocide. Israel in 2024 has been found to be perpetrating racial segregation and apartheid. Israel's leaders have been uh, the subject of arrest warrant requests for crimes against humanity. Um, everyone has seen the horrors that are being perpetrated on the ground, and everyone has seen members of the Israeli public celebrating those horrors. So this, this veil of legitimacy has been pulled away. And that means that between that and the finally waking up of international institutions, and not just international institutions, but I think we'll also be seeing uh, court cases and third party courts in different countries under universal jurisdiction to hold perpetrators uh, accountable as well for many, many years um, in uh, in the future. So so yeah, I think the, the Israel's 76 years of impunity are over. I don't think it's going to change the equation on the ground immediately. I think the horrors uh, that Israel perpetrates are going to are going to continue for well into the the future, but this is the beginning of the end of that impunity. And you know, even if I, I think there will be arrest warrants for people like Netanyahu, Gallant, but uh, others uh, that have not yet been uh, been named. Ben Gavir, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, all of these uh, yeah horrible creatures. Um. Of course, they will not surrender themselves to the court and they will be protected by their own government and presumably by their proxies in the West, like the like the US. But even now they have to think about their air itinerary. If they try to fly to the United States, not to cross over particular airspace, not to take an indirect flight. And that's only going to increase. Uh, and, you know, I, I am old enough to remember how we went from a situation where apartheid South Africa was supported by the West, including the government of the United States, straight through the 1980s, uh, while civil society, churches, labor unions, people in the streets were protesting apartheid in South Africa. Um, and, and they still had that support right up until the end. At some point, that's a that support became unsustainable because the people of all of these countries in the West said, no, not in our name, not with our money, um, we're, we're, we're not having it. So these things take time. Nobody predicted that South Africa, uh, 
that apartheid in South Africa would fall the way that it did, but they worked for that end until it um, until it happened. And we see a similar anti-apartheid movement, um, you know, targeted at the regime in uh, in Israel now that's growing by leaps and bounds this year in in particular. And so, uh, yeah, that day will come. And if you think about, I mean, what do we, in my letter, I said it, and I've said it repeatedly since, what we're looking for is simply equality. Democratic, secular country with equal rights for Christians, Muslims, Jews, and others, based on human rights and the rule of law, the right to return, compensation, uh, and a future not based upon ethno-supremacy, which is the current Israeli reality, but one based upon international human rights and equality. And if that's frightening to you, you should reconsider your politics because that is the moral course that was supposed to have been set at the end of the Second World War by the Universal Declaration, the UN Charter, all of the human rights treaties. And if it applies to the whole world, it applies to Palestinians and to Israelis as well. Uh, so let's make it happen. Let's hope. Uh, I really hope people will continue what they're doing. Um, it is in its own, own way very beautiful to be a part of, of the protest because you can really feel that the people there, you know, it, it's coming from the bottom of their heart. Like they really want an end to this. And that's why it's not going to go away. It's going to continue. It's going to grow. Ultimately, it will be victorious. I have no doubt. It's the pain between now and then that we have to brace for. Mm. Uh, and uh, and we've seen the the horrors do not cease, but yeah, no, this movement will succeed. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs>